After sunset, the dark nooks and crannies of our inner cities come suddenly alive and fill with the hustlers and the users as they meet and touch fleetingly in the structured ritual of a crack deal in the street. Crack is made from almost pure cocaine. When cocaine powder is snorted, it takes over 10 minutes for only 30% of the drug to reach the brain. But convert the white powder into a hard rock of crack, destroy the impurities, smoke it, and 80% pure cocaine rushes to the skull in a mere 10 seconds. No other illegal drug acts so quickly and so powerfully. There is an instant rush of pleasure hormones into the bloodstream. No other drug delivers such a magnificent high, yet demands so much in return. Changes your whole personality. Um, you become aggressive. Um, you steal. You lose all your morals. It is like no other drug that I have ever seen before. It certainly overwhelms an individual almost like that. Wars were fought over heroin and opium, actually, and, and, and it was nothing compared to crack cocaine. It is a decidedly 20th century drug, and it is the most vile thing that, that uh, civilized society has ever seen. Crack is simple to produce. Once cocaine reaches Britain, dealers convert it into this rock form. Custom seizures of the raw cocaine powder will soar to a record one and a half tons this year, and it all comes from South America. Bogota, Colombia, in the shadow of the Andes Mountains. This beautiful and savage country is the headquarters for the supply and manufacture of the drug. It's here the powerful drug cartels control the world's cocaine supply. Gross annual turnover, 200,000 million pounds. Costs are not overwhelming. The coca leaves are harvested, then in thousands of jungle lean-to laboratories, peasants slowly process the leaves, adding gallons of chemicals. First comes the coca paste, and finally, the familiar white powder. There are some tiresome overheads. Colombia's murder rate is 29,000 a year. Narcotics gangsters and self-starred guerrilla groups kill each other and whoever happens to get in the way to maintain control of the spectacular profits. On the weekend we filmed there, narco-terrorists ambushed and slaughtered 15 British-trained paramilitary policemen of Colombia's Narcotics Brigade. They are the one trusted anti-drugs force in the country. Just three days later, the British Home Secretary arrived on a visit to the heart of bandit country southwest of Bogota. Britain gives Colombia 11 million pounds a year to help fight the narcotics gangsters, aid which is as symbolic as it is practical. I think it's important that we back up a democratic government that is determined to have a police force that will continue to inflict damage on the cartels. These paramilitaries have been trained by Britain's SAS in techniques originally created for defeating Soviet special forces. A dozen British instructors are still out here. Now their knowledge is being tested deep in the jungle. It's uh, the climate, as well as the geography, so much against the police, that policing that problem over vast, difficult terrain against people who are ferociously dangerous in country where there are guerrilla problems as well. Uh, that brings home to you the enormity of the problem. Kenneth Clark is first invited to dress suitably for the occasion. The plan is to visit the coca fields and maybe see a jungle laboratory. This is Colombia's own Vietnam. Down below, the hostile forests and jungles are controlled by cocaine traffickers and narcotics terrorists. The Home Secretary is being given the safe tour. The intention is not to risk his life by dropping in on enemy territory.
But when Kenneth Clark was shown a large coca field below, he'd insisted he'd had enough of the aerial views. This was not in the original plan. The Home Secretary's insistence on a land-based inspection created problems for the handful of bodyguards. These coca fields were not safe. As Clark alighted, a hastily organized protective ring surrounded him and stayed within range of any possible trouble. The search for a jungle laboratory proved to be fruitless. However, the Home Secretary, his special branch detective and Whitehall advisors moved bravely, if somewhat pointlessly, around. The Narcotics Brigade helicopter, M60 machine guns at the ready, now flew in a low protective circle around the VIPs. The anticlimax of this increasingly tense trip was an opportunity for Mr. Clark to feel and smell for himself the vegetable source of the crack cocaine traffic. By now, the news from the air was enough for protocol to be abandoned in favor of a dignified retreat. Politely but firmly, the Home Secretary was asked to call it quits and get out as quickly as possible. The next stop, though safer, contained an ominous glimpse of the future. The use of crack in Britain is now being linked to a resurgence of heroin addiction, because heroin helps control the painful come down after crack smoking. High in the Andean mountains, narcotics gangsters are raping the beautiful forests of Colombia in order to sow and farm poppies. This is the raw material from which heroin is eventually produced, but unlike the tough coca leaf, the poppy is more vulnerable to attack. The paramilitaries use traditional methods. One field made infertile, but how many more to seek and destroy? They have moved into a new crop, which for them, for a variety of reasons, is much more profitable. We have trouble already with heroin coming from uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Golden Triangle, the Far East. And uh, uh, this new supply is springing up very rapidly. We do not want powerful operators like the Colombian cartels uh, going on from their domination of cocaine into the heroin trade as well. It is going to be a long haul, but uh, if we're going to be effective in Britain, where it matters a very great deal to us, we've got to be involved all the way from the start. And if we don't back up the Colombians in what they're doing against the people who profit from growing it in the first place, it'll weaken our efforts at home, which matter just as much to make sure that we deal with the trade, help the addicts back home. But the British cannot help prevent the endless flow of cocaine from Colombia's ports. This is Barranquilla, where guards are paid two pounds a week to prevent drugs being smuggled onto ships. The drug simply hemorrhages through ports where container ships hide substantial quantities of cocaine. This vessel routinely loads in Colombia, and her Dutch master regularly finds cocaine hidden on board. Sometimes we find the cocaine on the ship at sea, because we are making a search before departure of Colombia, and it's take about three hours to check the whole ship. And uh, at sea, we make a second search. So... What do you do when you find cocaine on the ship? Well, then we're going to inform the owners about this, and uh, they will inform the customs in the United States, so they pick it up. Cocaine is still leaving Barranquilla and South American ports like it by the tonne. Neither British nor international aid, neither the SAS trained narcotics police, nor the sophisticated spy apparatus of the old Cold War can bring this multi-million pound trade to an end. Britain's next line of defense is on the high seas, several hundred miles into the Caribbean, where the Royal Navy mounts a lone patrol.
the British destroyer HMS Cardiff. One of her Caribbean assignments is to run a floating intelligence platform for a British-American combined anti-narcotics patrol. All positions, uh, this is uh, the RO. New track of 1472, APS report. The Cardiff has spotted a target. An operations room equipped to engage the communist navies of the Warsaw Pact now turns its Roger. electronic eyes and ears onto a small fishing boat about 100 miles away. Roger, uh, Halfway between Cuba and Mexico, and the Cardiff begins to hunt. The destroyer's Lynx helicopter begins a sweep to get a closer fix on the target. I'll bring 230. And the Caribbean's most expensive bloodhound turns into the wind. Has she found friend or foe? Yes, Pete's Dream. Pete's Dream, this is uh, British warship Cardiff. Good morning. This is Pete's Dream back. You uh, got a problem or something there, Cal? We have caught 20,000 pounds of fish on board. Everything's fine with us. Everything's fine here. The British now summon up the U.S. Coast Guard vessel, the Escape, riding shotgun off the port bow. It's the Americans who have the authority to arrest and detain on the high seas, but first, more questions. Cardiff, this is Cutter Escape, Roger, ready to copy. The name of this vessel is Pete's Dream. Uh, we're going to alter our course and uh, identify this contact, uh, conduct some pre-boarding questions for a possible law enforcement boarding. Uh, we'll be standing by this net. Escape out. Motor vessel Pete Dream, this is U.S. Coast Guard. Can I get the length of your vessel, please? Roger, uh, 62 feet, length 62 feet. You got your pencil ready, I'll read off all this crap. Further north, in Key West, Florida, a secret American military task force monitors the operation. Inside this converted submarine communications base, the Americans and British are wired to the heart of an intelligence setup. Center, this is the CDO with uh, JTF 4.1. A huge computer database contains details of every civilian vessel known to the West. Submarines and even satellites are regularly used to hunt suspects. The screen reveals that a sister ship to Pete's Dream was recently caught smuggling cocaine. U.S. Coast Guard, Channel 1, 6, over. I think it's going back ahead. Sir, we'd like to do is send over a U.S. Coast Guard boarding team to uh, determine the status of your vessel. We'll be sending over a boarding team. They'll be boarding on your port side. Do not need you to alter course or speed. Once the boarding party are on board, they'll then carry out their routine inspection of papers and, uh, and documents, question the crew, make sure the papers match up with what they can see, and then if there is anything suspicious, they'll go further into the vessel itself for searches of the hull, hidden compartments and so on. In the end, there was nothing on Pete's dream, but many of these high seas intercepts do end in a more dramatic way. There's an enormous quantity of cocaine passing through these Caribbean choke points, and finding some of it is just a question of good intelligence and good luck. Yep, it's time to call in the cavalry. Yeah, your target is heading 258 at 22 knots. He's firing tracers. He's taking off again. He's running. This is great. Roger, we got him. There's arrests and seizures here, so let's make sure we get this one done first. Okay. Captain, I have given you one hour to stop your vessel. I am warning you that I am commencing to fire on your vessel. Are going to fire until they stop. Get hit. Got smoke, got smoke. There is no limit to the cocaine smuggler's desperation. Surgical implants are the latest ingenious idea. In this case, customs officers noticed the bulky thighs of a man entering Puerto Rico. The symbolism of the British commitment is significant, but there's little evidence that interdiction in the Caribbean is hurting the cocaine cartels. 
These criminal organizations are the new masters of the modern underworld, professional, intelligent, and deadly efficient. As demand in Europe surges, the whole of the Caribbean is now open for cocaine trafficking. Some islands are more open than others. St. Martin, a part Dutch dependency and an important link in the tight cocaine chain that stretches from Colombia to Britain. The island has become the despair of Western anti-narcotics agencies because of its slack laws towards the ever-increasing Caribbean connection. Here, you need to declare nothing. I've just come from Bogota, Colombia. Is there any customs here at all? No, no, no customs. No customs? No. So I can bring anything in and take anything out? Yeah, great. Thank you. Just collect your baggage and walk right in. So that's how easy it is to enter St. Martin. No customs, no questions, no fuss. These cases happen to contain our TV gear, but they could just as easily be stuffed with cocaine or cash. Frankly, no one here gives a damn. Small wonder this island is not only popular with tourists, it is a paradise for cocaine smuggling and money laundering. The strange involvement of St. Martin in the cocaine business was first revealed five years ago during a full-scale Senate investigation in Washington. Lawyer Jack Bloom was special counsel to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearings on international narcotics trafficking. Here was an island in the Caribbean uh, that was sort of lost in the cracks. Uh, no law enforcement to speak of, no incoming customs. And it was a connection point between uh, Italian mafioso, the uh, Colombians who seemed to have contacts with people on the island, uh, people from uh, Europe who were talking about this was going to be the way into the common market, uh, and really law enforcement paying no attention at all to what's going on. This island had all the pointers of a perfect home for drug traffickers and money launderers. Cocaine is the most lucrative commodity ever conceived by organized crime. From Bogota to London, it makes a simple profit of 4,000%, hard cash that then needs to be laundered into respectability. Once the, the profits are generated and they're in US currency, uh, once it is converted or gotten into any type of banking system, it can be moved around the world in the blink of an eye numerous times, from account to account to account. No possible way to trace that stuff. It's gone, it loses its narco-dollar character, it's, it's gone. And there's nothing we can do to track it, and to trace it, and to do anything with it once it gets into the system. Win or lose, gambling is a traditional way of laundering drugs money. It's all too easy to shuffle the truth about how much cash actually passes from hand to chip to bank account, especially on St. Martin. You had gambling casinos that had no customers. If you run a casino and you come up with an armored carload of cash, you say it was last night's take. Uh, who's to go back in and figure out exactly how many people gambled and how much money came through? It becomes perfect cover and perfect reason for depositing money in a legitimate bank. The island is a package to a favorite for Italians and Dutch, and the police presence on St. Martin has been discreet to the point of near invisibility. However, recently, the embarrassed Dutch have sent a special squad of investigators to look into corruption, drug smuggling, and money laundering. They remain on the island to this day. One of the island's more colorful hotel and casino owners is the generously proportioned Mr. Rosario Spadaro, a Sicilian-born local resident. His previous controversial business associations have led to speculation about the source of his wealth. Mr. Spadaro owns a very high-powered boat on which he entertains friends from the old country. He loves St. Martin and the island is grateful for his investments. His hotels and casino occupy the most favored sites on the island. The recession may have affected business everywhere in the Caribbean, but Mr. Spadaro somehow manages to struggle on keeping his hotels immaculate inside and out. Mr. Spadaro was once in business on St. Martin with an associate of the notorious mafia gangster Mayor Lansky called Eddie Cellini. I paid to Eddie Cellini 
one million dollars and the Edisalin, he sold his stocks to me. Did you know he was mafia? No. But bad luck has continued to plague Mr. Spadaro's choice of friends. He's being investigated by the Americans, his phones have been tapped by the Italians, and some associates have been questioned by almost everyone. Recently, a revealing role of film was acquired, showing top mafia men on what appeared to be a jolly junket on St. Martin. One of the pictures acquired exclusively by Panorama shows Mr. Spadaro sharing a happy moment with one Ilario Legnaro. He has since been convicted and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in Italy for having mafia connections in a case that involved money laundering and the control of casinos in Italy. Have you been unlucky with some of your associations in the past and perhaps in the present? There were phone taps were made by the Italians of you having a conversation with oh, Mr. Yes. Gracci. What about that? Mr. No, Gracci is supposed to be close to the mafia? Is that no, true? Mr. Gracci is close to the government, close to the ministry. Mr. Spadaro vigorously denies any connections with the mob. Yet there is anxiety about drug traffickers and their use of casinos to launder profits. Now there's a new headache for the inscrutable Sicilian. Whitehall is nervous about his attempts to expand into British territory. The British Caribbean island of Anguilla, a mere five miles as the speedboat drives from St. Martin. In 1982 and again in 1988, Rosario Spadaro spent one and a half million dollars buying 103 acres of prime development land here at Savannah Bay. His name at that stage rang no bells with the British. The plan was to build a huge tourist complex here, comprising a hotel, a condominium, a golf course, and a marina. However, the bells have now rung and planning permission will be firmly denied by London. So Mr. Spadaro remains on his island paradise with his retinue of friends and visiting business associates. His boat trips around the Caribbean will continue. He often travels to Anguilla for an offshore swim, but he may experience some difficulty landing there or in the United States. The US Customs have flagged his name in the immigration computer as a suspected associate of criminals. The American Drugs Enforcement Administration, the DEA, believe some four tons of cocaine is being smuggled through the Caribbean every seven days. St. Martin alone attracts about one ton a week. As the United States market reaches saturation, some 20% of all the cocaine rushing through the area is now heading east to Europe. Evidence of just what's coming to Britain emerged recently in an operation run by the DEA. An undercover operator set himself up as the front man for a Colombian cocaine cartel seeking new outlets. During this classic sting operation, he easily found a genuine buyer who knew just how much Britain could take. Special Agent Bill Mitchell personally took the order. We're talking about over one ton of cocaine that one individual believes that he can move. When I told him that he had to be very careful with his markets, we did not want him moving into our market in Miami or New York. He said, no, no, you don't understand. This is all destined for the UK. All right, this is one man who believes that he can move over one ton of cocaine on a yearly basis to the UK. Much of the crack sold on European streets has this man's brand on it. Ivan Erdinola, nicknamed Ivan the Terrible, seen here under arrest for murder in Colombia. He has a terrible reputation for ruthlessness and cruelty a man whose business methods reflect the new age cocaine trafficker. His personal signature on business matters includes torture, murder, indifference to human life. The local peasants have learned a fearsome respect for the man police say is responsible for most of the 300 bodies fished out of the Corker River. These are some of the little extras on the price of crack cocaine. Death was the first but not the final obscenity. One remarkable man has managed to penetrate and damage the Erdinola cartel. 
Neither his face nor that of his DEA case officer can be shown. Operation Wizard involved a Colombian banker working in Miami who was recently recruited as a mole by the DEA in South Florida. Uh, Dave, how are you? Hi, nice to meet you. Thanks, Ben. His unenviable assignment was to work as a money launderer for the Erdinola cartel, who've started shipping cocaine all over Europe. His espionage has already led to the imprisonment of several cartel members and a first-hand knowledge of the organization and the man behind it. The wizard dealt with Ivan the Terrible face to face. Of the well-known people in the cartel in Cali, he's by far the most feared, by far the most violent, and has by far the highest death count attributed to his organization. There were hundreds of murders in the valley, and some people were killed because they might have owed money and hadn't paid Ivan Odinola back. Some people, we now know for a fact, were killed because they did not want to cooperate in planting uh, what leads to heroin. So their land was confiscated from them, and they were assassinated by Ivan Odinola, always cutting off their hands so the authorities didn't know who was actually floating in the river. Are you saying that he uses torture as a personal signature? I know that he uses torture as a personal signature. Well, the organization that I was involved with moved approximately, to our knowledge, $300 million in one nine-month period. That's a lot of money. It's part of it. It's not all of it. Probably not even a third. What's the most you've ever carried? Two point four million dollars at one time. Does that weigh heavy? You had the car down quite low to the ground, yes. Can't you cheat a bit and sort of take a few hundred dollar bills out? You don't want to die. Miami goes the joke is handy for cocaine smuggling because it's so close to the United States. In fact, it's a nervous no man's land between South and North and the British also have their spies on site. Graham Honey is one of 17 British drug liaison officers, customs agents working undercover in the Caribbean region. Much cocaine is now re-exported to Britain from the United States. Miami is important in the sense of cocaine going to Europe and specifically to the UK. It's the Clapham Junction of the drugs world. It's a bit like Casablanca, the intrigue that goes on here. You have the bad guys traveling up from South America to meet the bad guys who travel from Europe. We are here to get the intelligence to identify the people behind the smuggling into the UK. Last year alone in the UK, there was one seizure of 900 kilos, which our intelligence would certainly show had come from South America. But British authority is severely limited overseas, a big disadvantage when it comes to challenging the international cocaine corporates. The world we're living in today is uh, a kind of global village. People can move from one jurisdiction to another. The money moves from one jurisdiction to another. The Sicilians work with the Colombians, work with local gangs and local criminal organizations. Yet we are all so hung up about issues of sovereignty and regulation that the law enforcement people can't do what the criminals can do. And the problem is we all get hamstrung dealing with an international criminal problem. And what everyone has to recognize here in the United States, in Britain as well, is that without real cross-border law enforcement cooperation, uh, the criminals will win. Uh, we have to come at it globally, multinationally, because it's that kind of problem. It's precisely these limitations on national law enforcement that have led to the retargeting of Cold War technology away from communists to the cocaine traffickers. This is Cornwall, and these satellite dishes used to listen to Soviet signals. Now, still on behalf of Western intelligence, they eavesdrop on the clandestine communications between international cocaine smugglers. This kind of cross-border intelligence activity is now beginning to hurt the cartels. Earlier this year, Britain's MI6 scored a notable success when officers uncovered the vital leads that exposed a cocaine ring operating through Poland and Czechoslovakia. It was run, allegedly by this man, Alonso Delgado Martinez. Martinez, a former Colombian University assistant, is currently in prison in Prague, facing serious cocaine smuggling charges. This villa outside Prague was the office for a joint Czech-Colombian import-export company run by Martinez, and dealing ostensibly in sugar, rice, and beans. 
The foodstuffs were usually brought by lorry from the Polish port of Gdansk and through the border with Czechoslovakia. Wooden pallets made in Colombia were used by Martino's company. From Prague, the empty pallets were due to be sent to a company in Amsterdam. It was Britain's MI6 who gave vital information to the Czechs, which made them investigate the pallets more closely. There was something odd about the pallet feet. Instead of being made of junk wood, they were made of quality Colombian hardwood. Czech drug squad officers took hammers to the hardwood sections. This official police video recorded the moment the pallet feet revealed their contents. 200 kilograms of cocaine, all of it destined for Britain via Germany and Holland. The wrappings confirmed the source. Ivan Erdinola, his Colombian cartel well into its export drive into Europe. Cocaine seizures in East and West Europe have risen dramatically by over 600% in five years, and the figure is rising. South American cocaine is now pouring into Europe and moving on by road through Germany, France, and Holland. A gloomy Brussels report this April warns that Europe is already a priority target for the Colombian cartels. The curtain around Britain is now very thin. The Colombian cartels already export some 20% of their annual cocaine capacity to Europe, and the figure is rising. Six weeks from now, the implementation of the Single European Act will end all customs barriers between EC members, and then Britain's borders will be left open as never before to the cocaine invasion. The lords of the Colombian jungle will then hide behind new waves of innocent day-trippers and bargain hunters expected to crowd the vulnerable points of entry throughout Britain. The cocaine will supplement existing stocks in cities such as Nottingham. Two years ago, a Home Office investigation found little evidence of crack on the streets. But Yvonne Pearson, a psychiatric social worker with the University of Loughborough's criminology department, repeated the study this spring and found a completely different drug scene. She went out on the street and gained the confidence of users, dealers, and those in the shadows. Her startling findings have just been published. You can buy one, two, three ounces, anywhere up to a kilo of crack quite easily in Nottingham. All racial groups are using crack. In terms of the street dealing, that's mostly um, controlled by Afro-Caribbean groups at the moment. When I dug deeper and started meeting people in the community, I was shocked to find how much devastation was being caused by the crack, largely unnoticed by the statutory organisation. People were reporting to me that some people smoked it daily, and that could be 100, 200 pounds a day. Some people smoked it in binges, maybe uh, two to three times a week, um, and the average binge 400 to 500 pounds in a session. Crack becomes all important. Um, the, the, your day is taken up trying to work out ways to get money for crack, and truthfully, there are very few legitimate means of earning that sort of money. This man is mentally addicted to crack cocaine and has long since sold everything he owned to fund his habit. Once I have one, I start thinking, where am I going to get some more? So I've got to raise the money for it. Normally, some guys go out robbing people. I don't believe in that. We found the, the come down um, on crack is so severe that it must be managed. If you don't manage your come down from the crack well enough, um, many people said to me um, how they harmed people, they got into difficult situations, they committed crime. It was important to manage that come down, otherwise um, you, you're looking for more all the time and you can't control your crack use. So a positive way to control the come down was by using heroin. Um, so what we found was that people who hadn't been using heroin before, because of the crack, uh, were using heroin to manage the come down from the crack and that was a very worrying finding. There are still very few places of hope for the hopelessly addicted. Under its American-born director, D. Klaus, Nottingham Clinic is pioneering treatment for the mental torment that is crack. Psychotherapy has helped one patient, Maggie, on the long road back from the drug. You might have seen it, Tom. I've seen it. Uh, people, I call it the cocaine dance. They can't, they can't be still. And they might be, they're crying. They're, they're, they want help. And their body 
it can't stop. It just keeps moving. And they, they can't make it stop. It's like the whole system is so negatively affected that it can take a long time for them physically to the body start to operate normally. It does not care about socioeconomic background. It doesn't care about whether you're male or female. It doesn't care if you're 14 years old or if you're 60. It's a drug that doesn't care at all about you or where you live or what you hold dear or the community you live in. It doesn't care. And how often were you taking crack? Every day. Once a day? No, once I started, I couldn't stop. I was running all day, all day, all night in the end. Well, but what does that mean? How many times? Probably four, five, six. So we're looking at what? 200 pound a day habit? A lot of money. I wouldn't entice nobody to smoke it because it can leave you dead broke, nowhere to live, no clothes, nothing, you know what I mean? Well, I sold all my jewellery, um, and when I ran out of my jewellery, I'd sell anything, anything I could get my hands on, um, whether it belonged to me or not. Clothes, coats, ornaments, cameras, anything. And all the time I'm selling these items, I'm thinking, yes, that'll get me two rocks, three rocks, four rocks, whatever, which builds up the excitement, and I was stoned before I'd even sold it. What's the most awful thing you've done to, to get money to raise crack? Um, take my daughter's ring in video and tele and sold it for it. That's the worst thing I've done. I stole money. From whom? From my children. Tell me about that. Um, my, one of my sons was working uh, during his colleges from university and his first week's wages um, I sneaked in and, and took them in the middle of the night and I felt really bad about it I really did it was tearing me apart but the driving force was stronger much stronger you lose everything um, about yourself that you could ever have all your pride and your morals and you end up with nothing. Today is Maggie's big day. She's finished treatment and is off to a halfway hostel in London. But is she ready to pick up her life again without the crutch of crack? I tend not to try to look too far into the future. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. Instead of listening to the little voice in my head, I'll try and bite the feeling. I am who I am today. I'm not Margaret the crack addict. The train is taking her to the city with the biggest crack cocaine problem in Britain. It's happened with alarming speed in just two years. Even dealers in traditional drugs like marijuana have turned to the high profit margins available with crack. This draft local authority report on drug abuse in West London estimates that there could be up to 800 crack cocaine users in Notting Hill alone. That crack is easily obtained and that drug clinics are finding crack addicts in chaos. Crack arrests show a 62% increase this year, and crack dealing creates higher levels of violence. West London's black community recognise that they've become major victims. Lee Jasper of Notting Hill's Mangrove Community Association. Um, we've got uh, a problem that is almost of epidemic proportions in the abuse of crack and cocaine. And uh, the problems are severe, very severe indeed. Now, when you, you talk about near epidemic proportions, that's quite a strong thing to say. Mm -hmm. it, it really is as bad as that? It's as bad as that. The spread of crack cocaine within our communities, not just here, I might add, but uh, throughout the country, yeah. is getting worse. I see the destructive side effects of uh, the abuse. Families being torn apart, uh, young people becoming involved, selling possessions, long-held treasured possessions. And when everything's been sold, crack addicts turn to robbery and theft. Users become dealers and dealers' users. 
The panic that follows the fear of crack deprivation means that this is a drug that comes with its very own built-in crime wave. There is an urgent need, if you're addicted to crack, to service your habit. Uh, it has a tremendously fast rate of addiction. So once you're hooked, you need to service that habit regularly and with increasing intensity. How are you going to service a 200, 300, 400 pound a day habit? The only way you're going to do it is by crime. When you're high, you don't care. When you're low, you can't work. Therefore, the, the only way you're going to be able to raise money is either by holding a knife to someone's throat, or by stealing from their car, or by stealing from their house. A man fairly recently arrested, uh, who by his own admission spends 400 pounds each and every day on feeding his habit, who is admitted to 200 burglaries at residential properties in the suburbs of London and 800 other crimes, breaking into vehicles and so on and so forth. A thousand crimes from one man, a thousand victims. Crack is the perfect drug to market on the street. In its rock form, its small volume makes it easy to handle. One rock costs 25 pounds. Dealers wrap the rocks in silver paper and often hide their supply inside their mouths, then pass them on in one almost indistinguishable movement. When the police appear, the dealer's unsold store is simply swallowed and later regurgitated. The profits are staggering. In a good week, a dealer can clear 2,000 pounds. Street organization is complex, with paid spotters, minders and runners working loosely together. And on the street, there are no real Mr. Biggs. There's enough crack around for everyone to become involved in London and elsewhere. I come from Manchester, and unfortunately, Manchester has been the scene of unprecedented uh, levels of violence recently. Shotguns, armed guns, uh, young black men killing each other at a rate uh, unbelievably so. And uh, I think that gives a pointer to the direction we're moving in, where the biggest killer for young black men in America is other black men on the uh, issue of drugs. It was taken from him, loaded, in a pub in Brixton by a police officer who was very nearly shot. I think we've had 25 or 30 guns back in the last 15 months. This is one of them. It's very dangerous, holds 16 bullets, and each one of them will go right through you and through your partner if he's standing behind you. Please don't forget it when you go out. We've got some... This special metropolitan police unit was, until last month, tasked to investigate the relationship between crack cocaine and violence. It'll always be dead, and we don't want it to happen. It was the shooting of a jeweller inside this shop in Brixton which led to the formation of the special police unit. These terrible shotgun wounds in the leg and the groin were made by robbers in what was a pointless attack. Evidence from the crime led detectives to a whole trail of crack-related crimes marked by a sadistic ruthlessness. A fairly recent case from North London, uh, where a young woman was kidnapped over a, a, a crack argument, basically, and she was kept prisoner in a house for two or three days. Um, and she was tortured by basically having her naked body ironed with an electric iron. And then when she was fainting, she had boiling water poured over and on it went for a very long period of time. By the standards that we're used to, we are now facing a pretty horrific time of violence on the streets of this country. Crack dealing in Britain is controlled almost exclusively by Jamaican gangs who brought a new gun culture with them. This man, now a police informer, was one himself. They are holy guns, man. They don't care, you know. They live by the gun. Because you used to be part of that yourself, didn't you? Yeah, I used to be part of it when I was in Jamaica. I fight for politicians, you know. I do things for politicians. You shoot people for politicians? When I was in Jamaica, you know. Yeah. Did you kill anybody? Well, I won't say. I did a lot of things for politicians in did Jamaica. You, did you kill somebody? Well, I won't say, you know. <laughs> it's my prerogative, you understand me. But you were a hard man, too, weren't I you? was a hardcore. That's why I can be here today and talking to you. Well, to be honest, I just know that drugs dealing, when it comes to heavy drugs, people will kill for it, because it's money. You see, if I was a crack dealer, I was selling crack, I'm going to arm myself with a gun because I don't want anybody come and take over my starch. I'm going to defend my starch. You see, if he come with a gun to take over my things, I'm going to shoot him first, or he'll shoot me first. That's where you get the violence into it, because drugs dealing bring violence. I know you can buy a gun on the street of England anywhere right now. How much? 300, 400 quid for a gun. And you can get a good gun for that? Good gun, automatic, Smith & Wesson, 38, any kind of gun you want. 
These photographs confirm the point. All these men are involved in the crack cocaine trade. Some are illegals who've been deported and simply returned to London with false passports. Each one has been pictured privately showing off the guns that are bringing the dangerous new violence to Britain. The number of black victims involved in murders or attempted murders in London has doubled in just three years. If you don't deal with this problem and deal with it as a global multinational business that's going to wreak havoc on your streets, create untold suffering among young people and create tremendous violence, uh, you really have a terrible time coming. South London, November 1992. Metropolitan policemen armed to the teeth of preparing for a drugs raid. The kind of response previously reserved for terrorists and madmen has now become routine. This morning, while London sleeps and the streets are empty, a special operations firearms unit prepares with military precision to confront the drugs dealing suspect. He is believed to be armed. There must be no mistakes. The circle of death and violence that is crack cocaine ends in a South London street as it began in the jungles of Colombia. We're nearly, nearly getting into small wars. And what we need is special resources to deal with a very special problem. I'm aware that the Home <coughs> Secretary has recently been to South America and has made himself very interested in what's going on. Um, I'm waiting to hear from somebody at the Home Office. I haven't heard from anybody yet. Um, but if it's not understood at the Home Office, then we're in for a good deal of trouble. Maggie's attempt to fight free of crack dependency and start a new life did not succeed. Her stay at the halfway hostel in London ended abruptly in depression and confusion. She left and during a lost weekend was once more seduced by the drug. Maggie has now returned to the Nottingham Clinic. She will try again. Oh. Streets. 